So I'll introduce myself. My name is Allison Horrix, and I am proud to be a park ranger at Blackstone River Valley National Historical Park. I am joined today by my colleague, Mark Mello, who's also a park ranger at Blackstone River Valley. And we are here with Devin Kurtz, who is the executive director of Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor. And they are sponsoring this program and working with us to put it on today. I wanna to welcome you all to part two in our Work Life Winter Series and to introduce the folks who have joined us here today we wanted to build a series around what we think is one of the most important issues facing people, not just in the Blackstone River Valley, but really in the world today. And that's kind of these twin problems of work and how to live around work. We gathered for a discussion two weeks ago and learned about different ways that folks were finding new purposes for old buildings. And we focused on mills and factories. Today, we're looking at work and wellness from a completely different angle. We're joined today by Professor Robert Foran, who works at the University of Massachusetts Lowell, as well as two individuals who spearheaded the National Museum of Mental Health Project, Paul Pivko and Alexandra Orlandi. They're joining us in a group discussion today, and they'll start by giving us a brief presentation on kind of their background, so how they come to this topic of work and wellness. Before we do that, do just wanna tell you a little bit more about what they're bringing to the conversation and, and where we're headed today. And again, if you're just joining us, please feel free to drop in the chat where you're coming from today. Uh, professor Robert Foran, Bob, is a professor in the history department at University of Massachusetts Lowell. He is a distinguished university professor and recipient of the Teaching Excellence Award. He is the author of a piece called Empty Mills and Zombie Cities, as well as the editor of a book coming out this year called Where Are the Workers? Labor Stories at Museums and Historic Sites. You can see more of his work in an anti-slavery documentary tied to the cotton economy called A Contradictory Place. He'll be sharing with us um, a little bit more about the history of industrial injury and wellness at work. Also just wanna tell you more about Paul and Alexandra who are here with us today. Professor Paul Pivko is a professor in the Grennan School of Business at Assumption University. Alexandra Orlandi is a practitioner in the mental health field and a graduate of Assumption. Together, they coordinate the National Museum of Mental Health Project which is a nonprofit and museum without walls. They research and create exhibitions that transform society's attitudes about and understandings of mental health. They'll be sharing more of the local area's history of national leadership with regard to mental health, as well as prompting discussion about mental health and wellness at work. So from here, we are very happy to hear a little bit more from Professor Florent about that history of work and health at the factories. All right, if the technology cooperates, we'll be, we'll be in business, we, we shall see. Um, if not, I'll do without the technology and do just fine. Hopefully now you can see slides, yeah? Yes, people can see slides or no? Yes, yes, yeah. we can. Okay, just checking. I've gone through a whole class sometimes with my students never telling me that uh, I was talking about slides they didn't see. So that becomes a little bit of a, <laughs> becomes a little bit of a problem. All right, so um, I come at this as a labor historian um, and also as somebody that for a number of years worked um, as a machinist before I went back to graduate school. And I always thought a lot about work and work environment and, stresses and strains at work. And one of the ways I think a lot about labor history is how right from almost the beginning of the development of in big industrial settings in America, the so-called first industrial revolution in the early 19th century, uh, workers are right away thinking about um, their time, their time at work and how much their time at work um, is draining them of interest for much of anything else because they're so worn out after the very long days at work. On the screen, you see an early um, painting a banner that was used in a 10-hour march 
1835 in Philadelphia. Workers early on, as I say again, were, were thinking about this. And it's not that workers in this time period were somehow getting shy of laboring. Um, they had been used to hard work, but the work was different. The work was, um, as a general rule, in smaller environments, in, in, in places where um, they had more say, more control over the workday and what they were doing. Um, but as these large factory systems grew, it became much more difficult for people to have voice at work. And we get what Karl Marx and other people are writing about um, in terms of alienated labor um, at this particular point. Robert Owen, who's a factory owner himself and a socialist and somebody who's thinking about these questions, actually is one of the first people that most historians would agree coined this idea of eight hours for work, eight hours, he called it recreation and eight hours for rest. Um, and he does this in 1817. Um, and subsequent to that, mo a lot of the worker movement in America and around the world, as we'll see in some of the slides I have in the 19th and early 20th century is focused on the length of the workday because people again are, um, are just physically drained from um, the rigors of, of factory, factory work. Um, there are lots of injuries and accidents that, that, that weigh, on, weigh quite heavily on people that affect how people think about their labor. One, one really huge catastrophe uh, took place in Lawrence, Massachusetts in 1860 when a factory actually caved in. It fell over um, in the middle of a work shift late in the afternoon um, in 1860 in January. It fell, it just, it literally collapsed. Um, full of workers, full of machinery, um, in the midst of the second shift of 4.30, 5 o'clock. It was dark outside, cold winter day. Uh, over 100 workers lost their lives. And when this tragedy hit, um, it actually caused workers around New England to refuse to go into their factories for several days um, after the collapse. They were concerned that their own factories were unstable. Um, they demanded that factories be inspected by outside people to try to sort of, you know, basically deal with this mental anguish they felt about, well, what if this happened in Lawrence, couldn't it happen in Lowell, or couldn't it happen in Fall River or New Bedford or, you know, somewhere in the Blackstone Valley or what have you. And this is really uh, uh, obviously incredibly disconcerting for, for most people. Uh, these accidents and, and these tragedies at work um, are gonna continue right straight on through. I don't think I'm telling anybody here anything they don't know, but it's just sort of create context for how people think about the, the demand for a shorter workday. Um, this is another major catastrophe. This happens in Fall River. Um, a mill catches fire. There are not enough ways out, there are not, not enough exits. Uh, and, and again, large numbers of workers lose their lives in this particular tragedy. Um, this is an engraving that, that's in the, in the uh, Fall River Historical Society. But again, making the point. Um, photographers are documenting how dangerous work is. They're, they're creating a paper trail for historians who think about um, how people approach their labor. Um, on the left-hand side of the screen, there's a photo that Lewis Hine took. Hine documented child labor and, and other labor questions in America in the early 20th, late 19th, early 20th century. Um, you can see from this accident on a really young kid, 13 years old, loses his leg in a coal mining accident. And then there's this headline from a newspaper um, about somebody who loses their life. Again, a very young person um, falling to death in a coal chute. And all of these things, all of this trauma really impacts and affects workers. Um, and there's a real, um, there's sort of a disdain, not every employer, but a lot of employers have um, a real disdain for their workforce and really sort of see workers in many ways as appendages of the machinery. Um, nothing better epitomizes this, I don't think, than this quote um, from this guy, George Bear, president of Philadelphia and Reading Railroad. And he's talking about these young kids, breaker boys who work in coal mines. Um, they don't suffer, they don't even speak English. Um, and so again, this, this sort of um, disregard for workers' lives. As the 19th century progresses, the work becomes even more and more distant from the way people had once thought about their occupations when people had more of a craft skill, worked again in smaller environments. 
aspire to to be an apprentice to learn a skill or a trade and then perhaps ultimately even own their own shop where they had control over the means of production the tools the machinery they were producing in small markets they knew their customers um, all of that's gone by the boards now as the 19th century progresses and more and more people are being piled into um, these work environments as that happens the labor movement around the world but our focus today is New England, Massachusetts, um, Rhode Island, um, workers begin to really think about this question of work, the workday, the length of the workday, uh, what it all means for them as these factories are being developed. Um, and the song that becomes synonymous with the eight hour struggle is actually written by uh, a Boston printer, a guy by the name of Isaac Blanchard, um, who writes the, the, um, the lyrics and composed the music by another Bostonian who's involved in the Boston Eight Hour League. And this again becomes a song that's sung at rallies as more and more workers around the country begin to build towards this massive work stoppage on May 1 of 1886. This is a bit of the lyric from the song in case you have never really sort of listened to all of it. I'm gonna have Pete Seeger close us out in a second with a singing a, a verse from the song because I think he, he obviously Pete Seeger's Pete Seeger. I don't, he needs no introduction. Um, but you can see when you look at the words and you look at what people are, are, are raising here as issues and concerns, they are deeply sort of thinking about um, what, what it means to toil, what it means to work um, as long as hard as they do um, and referring to it as the wasting force um, of life to live, right? That people are people are, are are working too long, too hard, and this is a movement that is is worldwide. Um, just have a couple more slides. This is a photo of a rally in New South Wales in the late 1890s with an eight-hour banner, eight-hour day procession of workers um, there at coal mines. This is one in Denmark: um, eight hours for work, eight hours of freedom and eight hours of rest, which is what it says on these three banners. This is in 1912. There are work stoppages in America around this question of the length of the workday and the ability of workers to have rest, to have recreation, to have time to just think, um, calm themselves down, get away from the work environment, the pace of machinery. This is a very famous strike of, uh, of workers um, at Woolworths department store. Um, if you're of a certain age, you know what Woolworths was. If you don't, I tell my students, think of Walmart. Woolworths was the Walmart of the early 20th century um, through probably the 1960s. And this is a very famous strike of a Woolworths where they're struggling for the eight hour day for the 40 hour, for the 40 hour work week. And again, this is really fundamental to labor issues right straight through um, into the 20th century. We don't in America get the legal eight hour workday until 1935 with the passage of the Fair Labor Standards Act, which doesn't go into effect until 1937. So when you think about it, workers, this first slide talks about workers beginning to protest around a shorter workday uh, and more time um, to think and contemplate life and play with their kids and whatever. Um, in the eight, early 1830s, it takes 100 years um, before that really happens. I just wanna, this is really quick, about one minute. Um, Hopefully this will work. Mr. Seeger, do your thing. Yep, there's always an ad. Skip the ad. Thank you, Mr. Seeger. And that's what I have. So 
that's I'm going to close the screen out and we take it from there. I think I'm going to close the screen out. Yeah, here we go. There. All right. Back to Thank whomever. Thank you so much. That's perfect. I think now we're transitioning the hosting powers over to Paul and Alex. So that should go quickly. So let us know, Allison, when you'd like us to screen share. I believe if you are ready to go, we are all set up for you. Okay, excellent. Alex and I are going to be doing two things. Uh, we'll take the first part of our presentation and talk about this really compelling history of innovation in the upper Blackstone Valley and the greater Worcester area with respect to mental health and wellness. And then we actually have some discussion prompts that we hope will open up a discussion that's anchored in today about mental health in the workplace. And I know that was of this session. So um, what I will initially share is a, was going to be a PowerPoint presentation and we decided we should just build a web page. And so the web page itself is, is all of an hour old. In other words, it literally went live. So you're probably going to be um, the first to see it. And so here comes the web page. If, uh, if my computer cooperates. Um, are you now seeing, Allison, America's Mental Health and Wellness Corridor? I can see it. Yes. Could, could, could someone let me know if, if you're seeing this? Can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yes, uh, I yes, can. We, yes, uh, I can see the website. I believe others can see the website. And I just heard Alex. Yeah, okay. I think are, it's are like you... it broke up a little bit there. Yeah. Okay, C can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so Alex and I are going to, you know, trade back and forth in this discussion of the history. But before we get started, um, it's worth noting, right, that this organization, the National Park Service itself, looks at the Blackstone Valley and, you know, of course, the upper Blackstone Valley included in there as the birth birthplace of the American Industrial Revolution. And, you know, so here's a, a map which was shared by Allison from the National Corridor. And most of the activity that we're going to be talking about, if this map were bigger, um, is north of the Mass Pike, and so okay. Um, are you able to hear me again? Yes. Yep. So I, I'm not sure where I left off. But let me just speak briefly again. You know, so here's a map of the Blackstone Valley uh, Historical Park. A lot of the innovation that we're going to talk about happens in the upper Blackstone Valley starting almost 200 years ago and really continuing through today in this moment. So we have come to view this area with a lot of inspiration because this is where we are from. Um, and it's important to note that like in innovation in the realm of the treatment of cancer or diabetes, um, it's not a straight line of progress. And there is always going to be um, suffering and loss um, with respect to new treatments for almost any ailment. And so while we take inspiration from the innovation, and that's primarily what we'll talk about, uh, we also take humility from, you know, instances of maltreatment and abuse that, for example, might have happened at Worcester State Hospital. Uh, so with regard to the history, 
the starting point in, in the 19th century probably involves Dorothea Dix and, and the institution that would go on to become Worcester State Hospital. And, and so those of you that are familiar with Dix, you may know that she was born in a part of the country that today is Maine, but used to be Massachusetts. Dix lived in Worcester, started a school in Worcester at age 14, moved to Boston, but did work um, that emanated in part from her time in Worcester. And so Dix was essentially a, a great reformer, albeit an imperfect one, who traveled the country after having visited England to see what was happening in England in terms of how those with mental illness were treated in society. There was a movement in England in the 1830s and 1840s to shine a light on that and this movement was part of what you could call the moral treatment era, um, bringing uh, representations of the treatment of mentally ill to legislatures, to parliament, trying to demonstrate to elected officials, there's a, a really shameful you know, issue here with how we treat the mentally ill. And, and so Dix essentially took that playbook from England and traveled state by state legislature by legislature advocating for change for the treatment of those with, with mental illness, um, highlighting abuses. And so no doubt that was a big part of Dick's legacy, arguably one of the most important figures in the history of mental health and particularly in the 19th century. Uh, also in Worcester, uh, <clears throat> the Worcester uh, Lunatic Asylum, right? As it would have been called back then, uh, was founded in the late 1820s, early 1930s. Some of Dix's work ultimately allowed for greater levels of funding for, again, one of the first state mental hospitals uh, in the country. And no doubt, uh, like every state mental hospital, there were these really um, you know, significant instances of abuse in this, instances, in, in this uh, institution's history. But there were also you know, significant improvements and society was coalescing around making investments in the realm of, of mental health. And, and so when we exit the 19th century and we get into the 20th century in the first part, Worcester again plays this really integral role influencing nationally the dialogue and discussion about mental health. And so at this point, I'm gonna, uh, turn it over to Alex to, to, to talk about uh, Clark University. And quick comment from what Paul was talking about. I think that it's amazing that Dorothea Dix was a woman activist. Um, I think that's just something that's wonderful that that's in the 1800s in the mental health realm and it's a woman activist. So I think that's also really cool. Um, but in 1909, there was an international conference at Clark University that held 175 uh, leading psychologists at the time. And Sigmund Freud, who was the founding father of psychoanalysis, uh, which is honestly the, probably the first thing you're taught in a psychology class. So it's a pretty big deal. Um, him and Carl Jung, Carl Jung was his assistant at the time, who was interested in psychoanalysis, but eventually broke off. But Carl Jung had, encourage Freud to speak at this conference and Clark University was the only place that Sigmund Freud had ever given a presentation at and it was a five-day series called the origins and development of psychoanalysis um, and it's just really cool that from there because he, he's German but from there bringing it to Clark University in Worcester to, um, to the US brought psychoanalysis over and it spread like a wildfire from there, which, you know, that's like the marking location in the US that psychoanalysis is the first thing you get taught in the psychology classroom started there. So that's pretty significant. Um, and then in the 1960s, things started to change more in the psychology realm. Um, old ideas were being challenged, and then mindfulness and meditation start coming into play. And Paul, would you like to take it away? Okay, um, thank you. I'm, I'm unmuted, I guess. Uh, so, 
so yeah, like so many other areas in society, you know, the realm of mental health came in for really a serious round of reform. The institutions like Worcester State Hospital, we all know of an era of deinstitutionalization that came about in the 60s and 70s, um, bringing resources, not enough, into the communities, um, bringing as many as individuals as possible into the communities. And this idea of kind of an opening up is a theme for a lot of the innovation that occurs and begins to occur in the 70s. And so uh, today we take the notion of meditation for granted. Uh, the, the, the tennis player, Novak Djokovic, who right now is a source of controversy for other COVID related re reasons, um, you know, we take for granted that, that athletes, top performing athletes, we might see them sitting on the sidelines by themselves in deep meditation. Um, not so, of course, in the 1970s. And so the Insight Meditation Society uh, was formed in Barrie, Massachusetts, which is you know, northwest of the Blackstone Corridor, but, but still in Worcester County. Uh, and ultimately the Insight Meditation Society became an internationally recognized uh, center for the teaching and learning of meditative practices. And, and that continues to this day. And, and so, you know, whether it's a, a best-selling author like Sharon Salzberg or her two co-developers of Insight Meditation Society, so much of modern meditative practice can really be traced back to organizations like the Insight Meditation Society doing what they were doing in the early, uh, or I should say late 1970s. The building you see here was a former Catholic novitiate. And so literally they acquired a campus. And uh, of course the Insight Meditation Society is still well-respected and active uh, through today. Related, uh, meanwhile at UMass Medical School in Worcester itself, you've got John Kabat-Zinn uh, working and again, inspired in many ways by meditation, beginning to form the earliest communications and um, discussions around mindfulness. And there's, there is a Zoom link I can't resist clicking on here. And so, so again, you can think of how the word meta mindfulness might have been viewed in the late 1970s or even 10 years ago. Clearly not a mainstream concept as today, um, but I can't resist clicking on this link and showing you an article, uh, assuming the, the technology cooperates, and, and maybe it won't. Uh, the article is from Parade Magazine. Uh, you know, certainly Parade Magazine, back when people received newspapers, there was no more you know, maybe widely read entertainment magazine than Parade Magazine, which was inserted into most Sunday papers. And, um, you know, and here's an article about John Kabat-Zinn bringing mindfulness to the masses. And I guess I couldn't speak about Kabat-Zinn in any manner, maybe more articulate than that in terms of his importance. And so I am gonna go back now and hopefully am I back to the screen yeah. that shows Insight Meditation Society. Thank you. And um, momentarily over to Alex. And so everything Freud did with regard to setting the stage for how therapy would be undertaken in the United States in the early 19th, 1900s in Worcester uh, itself came in for reform and questions. And today, uh, if you look, for example, at the Harvard PhD psychology program, that, that psychology program is essentially um, turning out graduates who are educated in the realm of cognitive therapy. And, and, and that is true in so many areas. And so as um, psychoanalysis began to be replaced and challenged by ideas like CBT or acceptance and commitment therapy or dialectical behavioral therapy, in the late 20th century was Aaron Beck, who ultimately formed a relationship with assumption. And so there's a nice sort of full circle thing here, maybe the largest figure with respect to modern therapy, having a relationship with our university in Worcester and becoming a frequent visitor to Worcester to do things like hand out awards to those who 
are seen as pioneers in the area of CBT. And so I'm gonna turn it back to Alex so she can talk a bit about CBT. Yeah, so as Paul was saying, it kind of transitioned over from like psychoanalysis being like the hub and then into CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. And the difference, the main difference is, is that with psychoanalysis, uh, the therapy focuses on the unconscious mind and things that happened in one's past that led to someone's current struggles. While CBT, it focuses more on the present. And the reason why CBT is such a big thing is that there is scientific evidence behind it. And um, so that's why so many therapists have started using it because they, they've seen that it helps. And what it does is it focuses on the thoughts, the behaviors, and the emotions. And what it helps you do is identify your unhealthy behavioral patterns. And you teach your, they, the therapist teach you problem solving skills and coping skills, and also gives you homework in a way to develop your own to focus on those negative behavioral patterns and then addressing them and reframing your mind. And the way that it's done is a little more like, there's more method than there was with psychoanalysis. So it is more valuable today than psychoanalysis is overall, overall, but you can use every, any method. Um, yeah, and then Paul, you can take over. Great, so, so I think we've gone a little bit long and I wanna try to transition us over to this discussion of um, mental health in the workplace. And the transition point also is a really interesting element of Worcester history. And so some of you may know this already, particularly if you're uh, in the geography around Worcester, but uh, the smiley face itself, this thing that has you know, become an icon, literally, uh, arguably traces its roots back to Worcester. Uh, in the early 1960s, the company that's now Hanover Insurance Company was going through a period where um, there was really low employee morale. Uh, it was a, a difficult workplace and they hired an illustrator, Harvey Ball, paid him $40 and what they were hoping to get was gonna be something that literally they could post around the building to improve the spirits and the emotions of the workplace. And Ball came up with, with the, um, you know, the smiley face itself. And so again, another really interesting element when you think of all the mental health positives associated with the act of smiling um, that can be traced back to Worcester. And so, so Alex, if it's okay, I'm just gonna now share the discussion prompts and you can give a little background about, about our exhibition. So we, have an exhibition about mental health for which we are receiving or yes, receiving and um, accepting contributions right now. And I'm gonna jump to, well, I think I'm gonna have to change my screen share. Jump to a power. And you can find more about I Get It, which is this vir virtual exhibition for which we are accepting submissions right now. You can find more about it on our website. So maybe what we'll do is skip the background, Alex, on I Get It. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and maybe you, you can just talk about these prompts and we can open up a discussion. Sure. So I just want to read the first prompt and I'm going to give my own example. I'm going to pass it to Paul to give his example just to get things going. But so first question, mental wellness in the workplace starts with the people. So what have you or others in the workplace have done to support one another when you're not feeling mentally well? And I work at a mental health hospital. So it's a little different for me because like my coworkers and I get a general understanding like that some might not be feeling mentally well. So, but something we like doing for each other is that if someone's having a rough day, we might tell them to go to the break room, take a breather, get something to eat. If they need to go home, they can go home. So we kind of give that flexibility if someone's not feeling well to take the time that they need to pay for themselves. But that's my example. How about you, Paul? Yeah, so another prompt that we hope people might respond to each of these or, or take and run with in a different direction. Um, another prompt, again, if you think of the workplace and you think of mental health stigma and you think of the holdouts, you know, the, the places where 
mental health stigma is still really most alive, you know, in many instances, this is the workplace, right, where it, it's still alive and well. Um, and so this other question, what can each of us do? What can we do um, in our workplaces to advance mental health literacy and understanding? And so wide variety of possibilities. One that I have done, and I went out on a limb a little bit, but I teach in a business school. Uh, our business students um, will enter the work world in a, re, you know, in a, amidst a reality where increasingly workers will need to, rather I should say employers will need to be much more thoughtful about how mental health and wellness is handled in the workplace. And so this summer, and I've done this twice now, I've essentially sent an email to my colleagues, uh, anybody who teaches business, asking them, what are they doing in their classes so that in the education of our students, we are forming business school graduates that are sensitive to this idea of mental health in the workplace, articulate with respect to it, and have an idea on how workplaces can operate different than today. So, so I apologize that we, we clearly have gone a bit long and we'll stop here <laughs> and hopefully we'll have a great conversation. That was fantastic. And, and I'm so glad that we're all able to see some of you and kind of continue the conversation. So that was exactly what we were thinking of when we kind of put this together. And I'll just tell you sort of the genesis behind some of this. There is a book that came out a few years ago about Lewis Hine photographs, photographs documenting people at work. And something that my colleague Mark Mello and I kept talking about was this photo that was taken in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, not far from what my background here shows. And it showed a kind of clinic within a mill. And we got talking about, you know, what do you think the experience was of being a patient and a young patient at that in that kind of place? And we hear conversations all the time about health and wellness and work safety, but, but what did that look like 100 years ago? So that's kind of the bridge that took us in these two directions to the talks that we were fortunate enough to hear today. Um, and did you have a question or, or comment you wanted to share? I, I just wanted to share that um, I've been working, um, I'm a healthcare provider, I've been working in a program that links um, CHWs with elderly patients and addresses their social determinants of needs. So things like housing and food insecurity and access to healthcare, et cetera, et cetera. And in the CHW model, CHW supervision is what we call supportive supervision. I've been doing it for about 10 years and it's very different than people that I'm, different than what I'm accustomed to or I had been accustomed to in that Prior to working with CHWs in the, this um, supportive supervision role, supervising people was always making sure they're doing everything right. They're doing things according to my timeline. They're doing things according to the corporation or the business's rules and policies, et cetera. CHW work is very different because the CHWs build a partnership with patients and they really take their cues from the patient. So I don't really govern what they do but by supportive supervision, what that means is that we build trust with the employee. We build trust as a supervisor with the community health worker. And part of that is understanding the stress that they're under, um, facilitating their self-care, um, checking in with them frequently, having you know, regular meetings with them about their caseload, et cetera, et cetera. And for me, that was a very different type of supervision because it really focuses on self-care and the well-being of the employee. And I think that that, I just see with the staff that I work with, that they really appreciate that. So going back to the first presenter with the slides of, you know, standing in lines and people, women sorting things or whatever they were doing, it's like you don't move, you just keep working because someone's watching you and it's going to tap you on the shoulder. And I think if anything good has come from the pandemic is people are looking at 
the work environment and hopefully some good changes will be made from that. That's just what I wanted to say. Thank you, Anne. And you bring up a great point, which is that even if people weren't trying to make change, so many changes have been thrust upon people in the past two to three years. Another reason that we wanted to have this conversation is we talk about work. That's at the core of what we greet visitors with, what our museum exhibits are about, and to not address the fact that, for example, millions of women who are caregivers left the paid workforce or millions of other people quit their jobs at unprecedented rates. It is a good time for us to start to ask people like Paul, like Alex, and like Bob questions about the history behind these things. We got a question in the chat about kind of regulation and oversight. Physical health and safety became a standard with legislation and regulation, OSHA, child labor, etc. What would legislation and regulation for mental health in a workplace look like? So, so, you know, I think of mental health in the workplace, and I think of essentially the environment and the culture, and then I think of the individual. And in the context of mental health in the workplace, I, I, I believe there is significant opportunity through the culture of an organization, through the environment, uh, and at the same time, even if that isn't there in an environment, at the level of the individual to help advance the, the dialogue and um, environment from a mental health standpoint. So, so legislation, is a little bit out of my league. As a, as a business person, I'm struck by the degree to which even prior to COVID, the business literature is now talking about mental health. Uh, I'm, I'm struck by, if I pick up a, a business magazine, there are discussions of mental health in the workplace. And this can only be happening, I believe, if companies and employers are uh, seeing more clearly that things like productivity and profitability and sustainability do indeed extend from a healthy workplace. And, and so, again, from a legislative standpoint, I, I, I hesitate to put forth ideas there, but in organizations, uh, organizations have tones and cultures. There was a wonderful program in Massachusetts put on by the Massachusetts National Alliance on Mental Illness called CEOs Against Stigma. The program was ahead of its time, and to some extent, it was a symbolic um, pledge by the chief executive officer, essentially asserting to the organization that the organization really wants to make change and wants to create a culture where mental health is handled the same way as physical health. And, and, and so I think more about organizational systems. This is more in my background, uh, in, in, in terms of my, my background in management and in accounting than I do about legislation. But I do think there are significant systems changes uh, that might be made in small and large organizations to create a better environment. And I think those things pay themselves back in terms of, of activity. If I can jump in for a second, I think one of the one of the challenges or one of the bigger issues is to think about how something like that would be done. And my fear is that if it's done only from the managerial side and, and not from organized workers, um, it ends up being a tool that focuses more on how do we get people to show up and do more work um, and that we're not necessarily dealing with the centrality of what what's happening right I mean I see that with Amazon I, you know Uber Eats all these all these things that came to prominence during the pandemic and I know that in the late 19th early 20th century when the 
when the stresses of uh, moving to these more automated assembly lines were being put in place, the, the early psychology profession, not everybody, of course, but a lot of people were employed by companies to try to figure out how to rationalize the work and make people accept being stationary at an assembly line all day. And sort of what were the what were the things that would be needed for workers to put up with the stresses and strains? And so it's tricky, right? And so I think the part of the problem, I think if you look at European settings, there's a bit more um, awareness and more being done, partly because unions are much more widely representative in, in workforces. Um, whereas in, in, in the United States, it's less than 10% in the private sector. And so it's a really difficult, um, a, a really difficult question. Um, and I think, uh, but, you know, the same, I mean, thinking the historical example of that mill collapsing in Lawrence in 1860, immediately after the mill collapse, there was this huge public response to try to take care of the workers and their families that were made destitute from the collapse of the building. And then the employers basically said, and the mayor of, of Lawrence said, don't send any more money, don't send any more clothing, don't send any more medicine, because the people are going to get used to all this stuff, and then they're never going to want to go to work again. Um, and so they, you know, I mean, it's a double edged sword here to try to sort through and, 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 and figure out. So obviously, we have to do it. Um, but like, I have no faith in, in, in Jeff Bezos at Amazon or at Whole Foods. Um, actually being all that concerned legit, legitimately about the mental health of the people that, that, that sell his food and drive his trucks. I, I, I share the concern Bob expresses, right? Uh, the private sector is not going to solve America's mental health crisis. And, 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 and if I suggested that in any way, I apologize. Nope. I, I do think the private sector needs to be integral toward improvement. And, you know, for example, there is innovation that can occur in the private sector. And uh, Harvard Business Review a few years ago had an article about neurodiversity in the workplace, the competitive advantage of neurodiversity in the workplace. And while, you know, arguably that article might be there from a profit maximiza maximization standpoint, um, the article highlighted some really innovative efforts uh, I agree with Bob. Um, we can't wait on business. We can't assume business will take the steps forward necessary to, to solve what is a, a mental health crisis. But there are interesting and innovative ideas. And, and one of them that almost threads together what Ann was talking about with regard to community health workers, um, some of the firms profile, these happen to be accounting firms. So I paid special attention to them. Uh, had instituted things like a buddy system. And what they had realized were there were certain individuals, um, often the article profiled people on the autism spectrum, so we're not talking mental health explicitly here, uh, that had really no desire to, to socialize at work or, or have to navigate the social complexities of the workplace but they did have these skills that society had essentially marginalized. Um, and, and so by instituting, for example, a buddy system at work, uh, I, think, uh, I think it's PricewaterhouseCoopers, but, but one of these big four firms or several found a way of enabling the humanity of these individuals to participate in the workplace and there is something to be learned there. And I do think that another way of doing it might be a community health worker model for, and, and that is a way of doing it now for other individuals who might need a greater level of support. But, but I, I, I hold out hope that even if it's for the cynical reason, right, of improving the bottom line, that employers are beginning to realize the centrality of mental health. And when we're competing against machines and when we're competing against other countries, whether we should be or not in an economic system, ultimately the, the human genius and the human capability to come up with ideas uh, is, is what sets us apart. I, I, I believe in part as people, um, even with, with the economic you know, benefits aside. 
thank you both for those great answers. So we had a question from John in the chat, and it's looking back a century ago to the pandemic of 1918 and asking if we can look at that moment as a catalyst leading to labor movement and reform in the 1920s and 30s, um, what could potentially change for us living through a pandemic now um, with the current health situation in regard to the great resignation? Are there things we can learn or, or what else might we be able to expect or even hope for? I can take a little shot. That's like, that's a whole semester's worth of uh, <laughs> work in, uh, in three minutes. But I mean, the, the, the lessons, I don't think the lessons, I've, I've done actually a lot of work comparing historically how people reacted in 1918 um, through 20 and how people are reacting now. And I've given a bunch of talks trying to get particularly my students and healthcare workers to think about the differences. And I mean, the, the aftermath of the 1918 to 1920 um, situation was that actually there were not a lot of lessons learned. People fairly quickly wanted to, to push it under the rug. And so we get, if you think of like your early, your history of the 1920s and whatnot, you know, it was the roaring 20s, 20s, it was the jazz age, it was bootleg liquor, it was everything uh, possible to forget. And it was also a period of incredible, um, a, an incredible escalation of racial violence in America. Um, 1919 in particular was re is referred to by historians as the Red Summer because there was so much violence against black communities. People took out a lot of their frustrations from the, from the flu pandemic and the war and the economy um, and turned them aggressively against um, anybody that they could sort of figure out to blame. Um, and so I feel like, I mean, my, my read on the 18 to 20 period is that nothing really, not a lot of good came out of that in terms of reflecting why, did, why were so many people ill? Um, why didn't we respond better? And we basically made the same mistakes in, in 2020 um, when the one we're living through now began as people made 1918. 1918 to 1920, there were anti-mask leagues everywhere in America. Um, there, you know, there were, there were people that were marching against masks saying masks took away our freedoms. I mean, it very much mimics, um, what we're going through. So I hope, I mean, my encouragement to my students and I've talked to in nursing classes and whatnot on campus is let's not do the same thing. And as soon as it's over, forget to really try to think about, um, sort of what, what should we have learned in 18 to 20? And how could we have done a better job in 2020 to 2022? Um, we didn't do that well in 1918, that's for sure. I'd like to try to bring the conversation back to a question Alex framed, actually. Um, I, I think no doubt it could be the labor movement. It could be the private sector itself. It could be regulation. Um, but, but, but I also think that any social movement that has made change has always come back and you know individual acts of courage we, we see these individual acts in the civil rights movement um, and 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 these acts of courage in one workplace by one person can create an impact and begin to change cultures and i really feel alex framed a very interesting question right if we think of what's under our control what could i do on monday when I go into work that's different, that could advance this cause, um, I do wonder if, if there's something here for us to be talking about uh, to humanize it and bring it back to the level of what we ourselves can influence. I can just say that my, my coworkers are amazing and I can, I can tell you from experience that it, it's possible to feel like you're in a really safe, mentally, emotionally safe space. Um, like my coworkers and I like we'll buy each other coffee to make each other's day like if someone's not feeling too great they might um, like even drive to go get one themselves or sorry get one for the other person like even in like the smallest thing makes a huge difference like I feel like I'm in a really safe space at work while I'm trying to do my eight hours of work so I think that's important. You know, you know. Uh, here's an example. Uh, what, what if um, 
you know, someone involved with this meeting uh, is in therapy and is, is willing to talk freely about therapist. You know, my therapist is outstanding. Um, you know, don't, don't these small steps begin to create the kind of cultural change that have the, the impact on individuals? Because that's who we really care about, right? Our project anyway, cares about what, that, that level of one person and one person's lived experience and their mental health. And, and, and so what are these things we can be doing to ensure that the stigma of the workplace, the stigma around mental health in the workplace is punctured? I think all of you have given us so much to think about. And this line from a, a pretty famous letter from the industrial age that kept coming through my mind was this notion, this has been cited many places, but this notion that factory owners treated workers much like their machines and said, when they break down, I replace them. And I think that's something that maybe comes from the factory, but has spread out to society, right? This notion of people as replaceable, institutions as readily replaceable. So we started this series and chose to look at these three topics as a way to maybe learn something from the past, but kind of get a little beyond that with the discussion, which I think we started to do here today. Um, we know that the past can teach us things, but are we willing to learn? And, and that might actually be the difference. There is a book that came out recently called American Made, and it's about what happens when work leaves, which is also a big part of our story in the Valley. And the journalist Farrah Stockman writes, jobs lie at the heart of the social contract between citizens and their leaders. And she's writing about why people care so much about work. I think maybe as a, a final thought to leave us on, and we're going to drop some links that tell you about what's coming next in this series, it might be a time for us to flip that question as we go on with our day and enjoy the, the beautiful 55 degree weather we're having in New England. Why? Why are jobs at the heart of the social contract? Why is that the first thing you ask a lot of people besides where they're from? What if we were the most fulfilled country instead of the wealthiest? So some different things to think about. We are uh, changing course in such a way when we reconvene on February 26th, could have a blizzard, could have a day like today. Either way, we will be talking about the history of the bicycle. And you might be thinking, my gosh, Allison, that is quite a change. It is not. We will be talking about the cultural significance of the bicycle with an anthropologist who does all of his research powered by a bicycle. Um, the building behind me in my photo also was a place where people rode bicycles joyfully in a derby style on what used to be a factory floor. So I know that I'm available. Um, so my colleagues are available to hang around and chat for a few moments, but um, I hope you have a wonderful afternoon and thank you so much for joining us here today.